something I need to clarify on the game industry is, is that there's such a strong misconception of what video games are. Um, to give you some 2019 stats real quick, I actually pulled these out before, uh, before this call started. 65% of all Americans play video games every day. And that is, isn't that crazy? Like a good majority of Americans play games every day. Sure, you're pulling out your phone and playing Angry Birds, but that's still a video game. And there's a purpose for why you're doing that. Um, 79% of all gamers say that video games are a very strong positive influence in, on their lives. And that's not what you would expect because everyone thinks that games are, you know, played by little boys who destroy their lives, right? Here's another fun stat. There are two times more uh, women above the age of 18 playing games than boys below the age of 18. Wow. Like, yeah, twice as much. Isn't that just nuts? Like video games are not toys for kids. And I think as a society, we need to start recognizing that. Welcome to the Phil with Forbes 30 podcast. This is Phil Michaels, Forbes 30 under 30 entrepreneur and performance coach. Every year, Forbes names the top 30 entrepreneurs, leaders, and stars in the world. And each week, I bring you one of them to help you level up in your life and business. From celebrities like LeBron James to Kylie Jenner and Cardi B, to entrepreneurs with companies like DoorDash, Instagram, and YouTube, you're sure to learn from the list. Thanks for spending time with me today. Now it's time to level up. Level up. Welcome to Phil with Forbes 30 podcast. Today, we have a very special guest. He made the Forbes USA list in 2020 under the games category. He started a game development and publishing studio in 2014 called Serenity Forge. It's released critically acclaimed titles like Where the Water Tastes Like Wine in 2018, as well as Lifeless Planet in 2014, which sold more than 500,000 copies. His team just launched the new psychological adventure game, Never Song. Projected revenue this year is $1.2 million, and he was driven to start his company after a severe medical incident at the age of 18, which we'll talk about in a moment. His platelet count dropped to a fatal level, and hospital staff told him he'd die within two hours. He miraculously didn't die, but was hospitalized for two years keeping his spirits up by playing video games, which ultimately led to him creating his gaming company, Serenity Forge. He creates games for good, using the fun of video games to help educate and even aid those that might be handling certain emotions like depression or even anxiety. Please welcome my very special guest, Z. Hey, how's it going? Very excited to have you here, Z. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining. It's my pleasure. And congratulations on your newborn. You just had a new baby and uh, being a father is a new chapter to celebrate. So congratulations. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, at this point, I feel like, you know, a couple months down the road, I'll probably be a lot happier than today <laughs> thinking about the newborn. Uh, but yeah, it's just been a phenomenal adventure going through this whole thing, especially with you know, the COVID-19 and everything is just such a crazy time overall. Oh, I can't imagine. I mean, you're, you're launching a new video game, which is the perfect time, it sounds like, during this COVID crisis to launch a video game, content consumption's at an all-time high, but you also managed to be a father at this, during this crisis at the same time. I mean, how are you managing both of these? Well, I managed by not sleeping. I, I think that's the <laughs> short answer to it. Um, but the fact that I, I think we are very lucky to be in the video game industry during this time. Um, you know, I, I, every day I wake up in the morning and just realize how uh, we're so blessed in the way that we are able to work from home. We are able to communicate, uh, you know, through Discord or, you know, some kind of Google Hangout or whatever, Zoom. Um, Meanwhile, all, their, all the people out there who work in retail or, or, or you know, restaurants or whatever, um, I mean, they are struggling really hard. And, you know, a part of me, honestly, I, I kind of feel bad, the sense that video games are doing so well, like you, like you mentioned. Um, I recently saw a stat where it said that, what, video game sales have, uh, on average, uh, risen by, what, like 3.5 times than before. Um, and that's crazy. And a lot of these game companies are just swimming in cash, swimming in revenue, cash flow this, uh, for the first half of this year. And I feel, I can't help but feel a little bit guilty almost. Like it's almost like I'm subconsciously taking advantage of the situation mm. uh, when everyone else is in so much pain. 
Um, that said, you know, that is kind of our goal, which is what can we do to give back with this extra, um, you know, resource that we have today. Um, we've been trying to hire a little bit more just so that we can kind of support the, the, the things that are going on. Um, and a lot of people, you know, on the other hand, are kind of not really uh, finding uh, success in their careers uh, in the meantime. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's kind of a, a fine balance. Well, I, that's admirable that you're doing that. I think you're not giving yourself enough credit. We got to play offense, not defense. And I think a lot of good is actually going to come out of this. Uh, even though there are a lot of people out of work, I think that people are going to reflect and reevaluate, you know, is this what I want for my life? Where do I want to position myself in the future? And so I think in some ways it could be a blessing in disguise, but I commend you for wanting to give back as well. And take us back to the beginning. Where were you when you first found out you were on the Forbes list? Um, so I think the original email that was sent to me went to spam. So it was uh, one morning at seven o'clock in the morning, I was rolling out of bed, and, you know, getting ready to go to work. And then I had like three friends messaging on Facebook going, congratulations. I'm like, what, what, for, for what? Like, uh, yeah, I already, we already announced that we were having a baby. Like you don't need to, <laughs> you don't need to talk about this. Uh, and then, and then like I dug a little deeper, like I literally replied, it's like, Hey, thanks. But why? Um, and then they told me about the Forbes thing. And then I went to the website and saw it. Um, and that was just like, such a phenomenal moment. Um, it's definitely been a dream of mine just as a kid, uh, having seen so many of my heroes make this list uh, since I was like in, in uh, you know, high school and college. Um, and, and the fact that I actually did this, especially on the last year, because I just turned 30 like, two, two months ago, um, on the last year, of, it was possible. So it was, it was kind of Good a work. phenomenal moment. Oh, yeah, it's such an amazing moment. And who was the first person you shared it with? Uh, my wife, uh, who was, you know, also in bed. With me. I was like, hey, hey guess what? <laughs> um, and she was like, oh, what's going on? Um, but yeah, no, it's that. And then I immediately shared with, uh, you know, some of my best friends who work with me every day at Serenity Forge. And, uh, and then, you know, it's just such a proud fun. moment. Congratulations <laughs> yeah. and welcome yeah. to the squad. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, you know, when I think about gaming, I think, you know, parents don't really take it that seriously. Mm -hmm. And they think it's more of a hobby or we're being lazy. How did you manage that growing up as a kid? I mean, did your parents ever look at it as a career opportunity for you? No, not at all. I mean, that what you mentioned was such a pain point. I mean, it's no surprise, uh, considering how I'm Chinese, uh, that <laughs> like, what, how, how many Chinese game professionals besides maybe esports players uh, that you've really seen in the West? Um, it's just, you know, like growing up, there was this very strong cultural identity of you're either going to be a doctor or an engineer or uh, nowadays business people finance people. And that was actually the track that I, I was on. Um, I was studying actuarial science. Uh, I was kind of, a, I would say math whiz, because there are way smarter math people. But I, math was never hard for me. And, and that was always been the case. Uh, so I kind of blew through math um, and, and just did really well in finance and was on track to go to Wall Street investment banking. I worked at the Federal Reserve for a bit. Um, and, and it's just like doing all sorts of that stuff. Uh, and at one point, uh, I, I, while I was at the Fed, I was um, having this, uh, it's, it's kind of hilarious. I was, um, I was on this trip doing a bank audit. So, you know, like the men in black wearing suits and ties, sunglasses, going to a bank. It's like, give me your, you know, books. We're going to sit down and like, you know, audit everything. So I was on one of those trips. Uh, and then uh, afternoon, I went back to my apartment or not apartment, my uh, hotel, uh, which, you know, was a whole suite and everything because they really treat those employees well. Uh, and uh, I ordered some, you know, sesame chicken delivery. The dude showed up. He's like, wow. I saw my badge. I was like, whoa, what do you do? It's like, I work at the Fed. It's like, wow, that's so cool, man. Like, oh, man, you're like the coolest person I've ever seen. And it's like, oh, yeah, thanks, dude. And then like I sat down in my underwear, ate that sesame chicken. And then I thought to myself, you know, like that was pretty neat. But at the same time, that was probably as cool as when I was in college, just working with my buddies in one of our basements uh, on a scrappy, shitty desk that we found on Craigslist uh, and, and just working on games and like these pointless small games. And that was just as fun. So I thought at that moment, 
you know, like how much more fun would it be if I actually ran a company and just took it to greater heights? Like that would be so much more interesting to me, so much more passion for me. Um, and that was the moment that I actually decided to quit and, and not do that anymore. So <laughs> yeah, you were I mean, like, like, let me take gaming to the next level. It's not just going to be a hobby, but we'll turn it into a business because you had the professional background, but you also had an interest in gaming. But how did you even get to that point? I mean, where take us back to where you were born, where you grew up that ultimately led to you working in the Fed? Yeah, yeah, totally. So I was born in China. I moved to the United States when I was 10 years old. My dad was an engineer. Actually, both my parents were engineers, but um, my, my mom doesn't speak English. So after she came here, she kind of had to work in factory jobs. And it's, it's the unfortunate truth of first generation immigration. Um, you know, in the in the 90s. Um, and then, you know, growing up, I was kind of pushed uh, a lot by my parents, uh, pushed a lot by my peers in school. Um, I had very little friends. Um, I had a lot of trouble in school, in middle school and high school, uh, which uh, kind of made me, uh, you know, just like imagine this like 250 pound chubby Asian kid back in like high school. That was literally me. Like I was super overweight, didn't have much friends, played video games all day, um, and just like didn't do well in, in school, in class. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, because of that, um, when I went to college, uh, I, my first semester in college, I ended up uh, having a really serious illness. It was actually Halloween. Uh, uh, the day of Halloween, I was diagnosed with a severe and fatal uh, blood disorder that caused me to be hospitalized for two years. Um, that night, the excuse me, um, that night, uh, my platelet levels dropped uh, to a very fatal uh, number. And, um, you know, I was bleeding all over the place. My entire body was covered in bruises, uh, you know, nosebleeds. I was fainting constantly due to the low blood pressure. And, um, and eventually they said that, you know, these transfusions aren't really working and you're probably not going to make it. Um, told me to write a will. And I was all the way in Illinois at the time. I'm from Colorado. So my parents uh, weren't even around. I didn't have any friends my first semester in college. Um, yeah, so that was a that was a really difficult moment. And obviously, you know, miraculously, I didn't die that night. But, wow. um, but yeah. you're in the you're you have no idea what's going on. You have no family around no friends around. That must have been such a scary moment. You're in the hospital bed. And a nurse just says, here's your will. And yeah. you're an 18 year old kid. And you're like, what? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I remember sitting there at first, I was like trying to be calculative. I was like, okay, well, I guess maybe I should give my laptop to Kevin, uh, give my Pokemon cards, oh you know, like I was gosh. like literally thinking about it. And then about five minutes down the road, I suddenly realized, um, I suddenly realized like what was actually happening. Um, and that moment, I just started bawling, uh, you know, crying uh, in my room. And, uh, and it wasn't because I realized I was going to die. Because honestly, at that point in my life, um, there wasn't too much to look forward to. I wasn't really enjoying life. Um, you know, like I wasn't, this is one of the first times that I actually shared this, which is like, like I didn't feel sad about myself dying. But what I did feel sad about was I realized that my parents would no longer have me around. Um, and that mm. made me feel terrible because uh, my parents love me very much and, and they are, I, I am the world to them. And uh, I realized that I'm robbing them away from, their child who they just spent 18 years with. Um, and that's, that's something that I realized I couldn't handle. Um, but yeah, I mean, I called my parents and then they jumped in the car and, and just like literally just hopped in the car and started driving to Illinois. Wow. Um, and they made it overnight. And then in the morning they showed up in, uh, in the hospital um, and I was still there. Um, so yeah, yeah thank I mean, you for sharing that moment because <laughs> it seemed like you had this light bulb moment where you're like, oh my gosh, this is a reality of it. And you're calculating what you're going to do about that moment. But then at one point, you felt almost depressed, like, you know what, I'm okay with leaving this world from a selfish standpoint. But then from an unselfish standpoint, when you started thinking about your parents, well, wait a second, this isn't just about me. This is about my family, the people exactly. that care about me, the, the people that love me. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, the truth is, uh, what is life really, right? Because because having gone through that experience at the at the age of eighteen really made me uh, kind of have a new perspective on things. I realized that you know when we're dead, we're not going to feel sad anymore. <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. the, the whatever it is that we do during this time while we're here is is purely just a gift. Um, it's it's really what we make out of it, and ultimately none of it matters. It, it's 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 a really weird thought. Um, but, you know, everyone dies and that's a very universal truth. And, and ultimately, you know, if you're dead, you're not going to feel sad. You're not going to feel upset. Um, you're just not going to be there anymore. Your pain uh, so, might go away. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so the way I see it now uh, and since then is the fact that uh, that night I was prepared, I was ready, mm-hmm. and I was I was dead that night um, because I was already gone. Um, but I realize that now every moment of my life is really just an extra. It's a it's it's something that's a bonus, I guess. Uh, so why not do something for other people? Why not do something that's nice for our society while I have these, you know bonus years uh, on top of what I oh, had. Oh, that's a great way to look at it. It's like you accepted the fact that you were dead already. Mm-hmm. So now every moment that you have awake is a gift. Exactly. And now that I have this gift, how can I share it with other people to impact their lives in a positive way? And that's how you ultimately formed your business to give back to others through, yeah. through one of your passions. Totally, totally. So what happened is, um, you know, after two years of being in the hospital, I actually slowly started to recover. Um, the, the truth was my illness was one of the first cases in the world and I couldn't identify what actually was wrong with me. Even today, um, it's, uh, it's labeled as idiopathic because of it. Um, so, uh, so eventually they just kind of sent me home. They, they tried everything. I went through chemotherapy, multiple uh, different types. Uh, I went through, uh, you know, all sorts of like just, just, you know, experimental treatment and all of that stuff. Um, and after I went back, I started actually getting better. Um, I think it's probably just the time or maybe some other things that I did, resting and all that. Uh, but eventually I went back to school um, here in wow. Colorado. Um, and, uh, and I decided to, that first year after going back to school, I kind of looked back on my experience um, and realized that, you know, like during this time period when I was in the hospital, I played a ton of video games because I didn't really have anything to look forward to. I was constantly <laughs> in a state where doctors are like, well, okay, maybe you have another two weeks, maybe you have another month or so. Um, and that was my life. Like Im- imagine if you're constantly feeling like you're about to die in the next month. Um, that's literally how I lived for two years. Um, so, you know, like, so what's the point, you know, as an 18 year old kid, I'm just like, okay, well, I'm just gonna watch TV and play video games. <laughs> like, there's no point. To yeah, you're like, let me make myself. the most of this time. I'm not going to be out socializing with other people. I'm not going to school. But how could I make this an impactful time for myself? And first of all, I must say you, you're, you seem like a very extremely positive, upbeat, <laughs> uplifting type of person after going through such a traumatic experience. I mean, I commend you on that alone. And that energy, you know, I'm sure rubs off on other people too, in a positive way. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad. Yeah, thank you so much. You seem like a bundle of joy, which is great. And then also, <laughs> you took that time and you're like, how, how can I make the most of this? How can I make it fun? So what did you do? Buy like a PlayStation or an Xbox? Or what did you do to, to play video games in the hospital room? It was just a laptop. Um, my, I, you know, a computer goes a really long way <laughs> with, with the internet connection. I played so many games via laptop. I didn't really have many game consoles. So I would emulate them on my laptop. I played a lot of the old games because the laptop isn't good enough to play PlayStation games. You know, there I'm, I'm essentially illegally downloading these Super Nintendo games, all these old school games, and just kind of playing through them. Whether if it's you know Chrono Trigger or you know NBA Jam on the on the on the as Super Nintendo. Um, I ended up playing a ton of multiplayer games, games like mm-hmm. League of Legends, uh, games like mm-hmm. Minecraft, um, and, you know, like just uh, MMORPGs, made a lot of different friends from around the world who, you know, a lot of them didn't even speak English, but they ended up uh, becoming really close friends uh, to, to me because those are the only people I interact with. And they would check in with me and be like, hey, are you taking your meds? Are you getting proper sleep? Hey, see, wow. it's time to, time to sleep for you. I'm pretty sure now it's nighttime in the United States. It's time for you to sleep. Um, and, and those friends I still That's hang awesome. out with. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, like I looked back in my first year of college that video games essentially saved my life, um, especially during such a difficult time. Um, but, but these games weren't really designed to help me, right? Like mm. League of Legends, I don't think anyone in the world can argue that League of Legends is designed to save people's lives. Um, but, but it did. So I thought to myself, what if we start creating video games with the intention to help other people? What kind of power can we unlock there? Um, and that's why I started Serenity Forge. <laughs> so when you're, you left the hospital, you go back to school, and then what happened? How did you move from school? You went to the Fed and you said, all right, I'm quitting this job. I'm going to start my company. But what was the first thing you did to start your company? Yeah, so even, even before the Fed stuff, you know, my first year in college, I thought about making games for good. So I, I started learning C++. I literally, I mean, I was a finance major. 
Uh, so I, and I didn't want to pay the extra tuition for programming. <laughs> so I literally just like went to the school portal, looked up C++ classes and just sat in the back. And, and, like I, I would just add it onto my schedule, but it's, I'm not, uh, not actually enrolled. I would go to, I would sneak into the midterms and actually take it. And the professors always get confused what? on who this like, Asian guy is that's not enrolled. <laughs> um, You're sneaking into the midterms. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah. And just, just to see how I do, you know, like I want to make sure that I actually know what I'm doing. Um, and with that, I learned enough to essentially program my own games uh, without paying a cent. Um, and then um, I, uh, I used that knowledge to kind of put together a, uh, my first game, which is called Loving Life. Um, it was a non-fictional visual novel uh, based on the experience of my illness. I, I literally just detailed everything about finding out about my illness, my hospital trips, and, and everything there. Um, and I just made it and I, it was a 45 minute game. I released it online for free for people to download and play. Um, and about a month after I released it, cause I just kind of tossed into the wild. I was a freshman in college, so I didn't really know what I was doing. About a month after I launched it, I got this email from a kid in Spain, a high schooler in Spain. Uh, and he was, you know, didn't really speak English, kind of typed all this broken English, but I was able to piece it out together. And he said that he wanted to thank me for making this game. Cause it turns out that for the past couple of years, he's been struggling with depression and he's actually um, been planning to take his own life. And while he was going through online resources, he somehow managed to come across my game and he played it and it motivated him so much that he decided to put a stop to his plans. He actually just enrolled into a game design school himself so that he could make games uh, wow. with the same type of intentions to share his own experiences. And I was, you know, I was at uh, Wells Fargo as, at an internship <laughs> that summer and I saw this email and I was like, holy shit, like, sure, I didn't make a million dollars off of my first project, but I might have actually saved a human's life with what I just did. Um, and You're like, wow, maybe there. there's something here to, you know, to this. Yeah, exactly. You know, I'm onto something here. Um, so that really gave me the motivation to keep going forward. I realized that I was onto something that's meaningful and I wanted to keep doing that. So uh, I planted the seed. You, you said, you know, this is what I want to do. I'm now starting to get some validation from a potential future customer. For example, I saved this person's life and, but, but you didn't make the jump yet. I mean, I, the jump is hard to say, right? Like I would never say that Serenity Forge is a startup or entrepreneurial spirit or, or anything. Like I don't consider myself an entrepreneur because I don't, mm. I don't, I've never had a business plan. We are just a bunch of kids making video games together. Um, but from that point onwards, I reached out to a couple of my friends and ask them, hey, you know, this game did this. It's kind of interesting. Um, do we want to like make a bigger game together? Because we can probably do better with more than one person. Like let's, so I reached out to a programmer friend of mine. I reached out to another person and the three of us like literally just like, okay, yeah, let's get together and make a game. And we decided to make this planetary physics game where it's like, it's Angry Birds, but, um, but it has 100% real physics in it. So you're like learning rocket science without realizing it. Um, we showed the game to Bill Nye and Buzz Aldrin at one point uh, later down the road. And that was a huge amount of validation as well. And just, just you know, all of that kind of happened while I was in college um, to the point where we have, by the time I, I was graduating uh, college, I already had like a couple of full-time employees uh, while I was wow. still a full-time student in school. Um, and, I, and it just kind of made sense to- So you were doing this concurrently. You were doing the Wells Fargo job and, and the Fed path, like this career path of finance was still happening mm -hmm. concurrently while you're building video games. So you were, an, even though you don't call yourself an entrepreneur, you're entrepreneurial minded and you were more of an artist using games for good and, and you were creating and designing them. You were more like an artist. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd hope so. I like to be labeled as an artist because I used to do a lot of art. Um, I, do, I, I was actually more of an artist at heart. I only learned programming because I didn't know it to make games. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, art has always been a thing that was in my life. Drawing, painting, uh, oil painting is one of my biggest hobbies. Uh, you know, just you know, composing music even. So yeah, no, it's, uh, I, I guess that's, a, that's probably a pretty appropriate way. To a lot it. of people use paint and drawing for therapy. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you created games as a therapeutic way to help turn your pain into a gift. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that first game I did not make for anyone else. I made it for myself. And, and it just so happened that I helped other people, too. So 
Yeah, this is amazing. I'm, I'm seeing a, a common pattern and trend with all the guests I've been having on. It's like <laughs> some traumatic moment happened, some pain that they had that they were experiencing and suffering from turned into their greatest gift to serve others, to impact others, to create their business. And one of the first episodes was actually Cliff, who was dyslexic. And he turned that into his business now, which is called Speechify, because he was able to learn through or recordings. And so his app turns text into speech. Wow. It's just amazing. And, and you're a similar story where you had this, this traumatic pain and you turned this into a gift now. And so once you did that, once you were at the Fed and you made that decision, how did you make the ultimate leap to really invest in it full time and, and stop doing two jobs? I mean, the, the biggest, the di most difficult part was the call with my mom. Like, honestly, that night when I called my mom and told her what I decided on, we talked for four hours. Talk is a, <laughs> is a, is a, is a good way to put it. Screamed at each other is probably a little bit closer to, to reality. Um, but eventually, I, I think the, the nature of my parents is that they want the best for me. Um, and they didn't understand what I was doing and they probably still don't really understand what I'm doing today uh, to, to a large degree. Um, but they still know that they want to support me hundred percent, no matter what I do. So ultimately, you know, after talking with them and just kind of going through a, a couple of weeks of back and forth and, and, you know, still trying to maintain our, our, uh, our relationship, uh, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't so hard, you know, just get up and go, man, like <laughs> just drive away. It's, it's not really not that tough. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I remember going back to that basement. We were working out of our basements uh, uh, at the time, going back to that basement and just feeling that sense of freedom. Uh, that was mm. so relaxing. It was so, I felt so liberating. Right. It was so, I felt so correct um, of a choice. And and I I have never doubted that choice. Like not, not a shred. So, so yeah, I mean, like it's I, liberating I that, yeah. because it, it, you're like, ah, oh, finally I get to do what I desire, what mm -hmm. I want, what I feel my true purpose is my true competency, but my true passion that intersection is, is where you find your purpose. And a lot of people do things because of what societal norms tell us to do mm -hmm. or our parents expectations tell us to do or our peers. And yet when you leave all that behind and you find a path for yourself, it's liberating. Absolutely. Yep. It's That's like a exactly huge weight lifted mm -hmm. off your shoulder. Yep. yep. So what would you say is the single most important personal attribute that got you to where you are today? I mean, now you're um, making over $1 million in revenue. Your parents must be proud. Well, what do you think is the personal attribute you had to get you here? So, so I think in, there were two different, distinct different ones based on what stage of my life it was. Um, earlier on in my life, I think this wasn't really my choice, but the multicultural background actually helped quite a bit. Um, I was born in China, came here when I was 10. I'm fluent in Mandarin still. Um, so, so one of the things that um, was very unique is growing up in like middle school and high school, it was very apparent that I was able to see things from a different perspective, way more so than other people. And I, I think that's still very relevant today. But you know, as adults get older, this particular aspect isn't as important because everyone is starting to able to empathize with others and kind of see different perspectives. But at a younger stage in life, it was so much easier for me to kind of make decisions uh, make more educated decisions, I guess, for just every aspect. Um, I think the fact that I chose to go start my own company, the fact that I didn't buy, drink the Kool-Aid that, you know, college would, would try to, you know, teach you. I mean, the fact that college keeps on pushing like, oh, yeah, go work for these companies because that's how you find success. Well, it's because these companies are paying the colleges to funnel students over, right? Uh, like the fact that I didn't even drink that Kool-Aid probably attributed a lot, like it was a lot um, because of that. Um, but nowadays, um, I'm realizing that I'm kind of shifting to the second phase, right? Like, I'm not just a kid starting a company. Like, this is actually a real thing. I have real employees that I need to make sure that I'm responsible for. Um, and now I'm realizing that in order for me to actually stand out from the crowd, is actually this very weird but undying thirst for, uh, for, for knowledge. Uh, just, the, just the fact that I'm super curious is, has been really interesting. You hear stories about people who go on down rabbit holes of Wikipedia pages and reading all whatever, right? Um, I'm starting to feel a lot of that myself. And to me, 
that has helped quite a bit in my career. Uh, a lot of times I would, I would be able to draw a lot of inspirations and knowledge from different fields, different industries, and put them into the game industry. Whereas otherwise, the game industry is actually quite siloed. People play games and then people make games. Well, you can't just you know, have inspiration come from other video games because then you're just really not creating anything new. So I think that aspect has helped me a lot too. Being genuinely curious. I love that. Mm -hmm. And knowing what you know now along your journey, what's been maybe the biggest lesson you've learned that maybe you wish you learned a little bit sooner? Huh, that's a tough one. I don't know. I mean, like there's a famous Tim Ferriss question that he always asks on his podcast, which is, uh, you know, if like what kind of advice would you give you like your teenage self or like 10 years ago yourself? Um, like, honestly, there's probably nothing too uh, grandiose or easy to digest that I can just like sum it up in one sentence. Um, chances are, it's probably a lot of things that are very minute, very detailed. Um, and besides, you know, buy Bitcoins early, there's really no, nothing like too, <laughs> no, nothing too like specifically like easy, like key to golden key to success. Um, you and and you know, it's, it's, I, I think it's, it's, it's also a little bit difficult to, to think that life is that simple sometimes. Um, <clears throat> The advice that I probably most commonly give people, uh, you know, when a question like that is asked, is actually advice that I received when I was at the Fed. <clears throat> I had a very uh, opportune moment um, where I had uh, the, just the amazing uh, opportunity to uh, have lunch with uh, then uh, Chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, Dr. Ben Bernanke. Um, and, uh, and during that time, I, I managed to kind of sneak in a question and ask him, you know, like, what kind of advice do you have for like college kids like us, you know, like these young kids in their early 20s going to the world? What advice do you have? And this is what he told me. He said that there are a lot of very unfortunate people in the world. Um, if you think about people in Africa or rural China or whatever, um, then these people are so unlucky that they have to walk four miles every day to carry drinking water back to their village to feed their kids. You know, like if you think about it, we are super, super fortunate. Um, he said that if you're one of the very, very lucky, fortunate people in the world, people that live in America, um, you know, you have the ability to, to essentially choose what you want to do rather than be forced into what you have to do to survive. And, 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 and we should be, we should be open-minded into taking these opportunities. We should realize that we are the lucky ones. And, and by doing, by taking these opportunities, by choosing what we want to do, that's how we truly make a difference in our world as well. And that's how we feel a sense of happiness. Um, so, you know, especially upon hearing that, I was like, okay, yeah, definitely I'm not working here anymore. Um, but <laughs> but, but the, the, the truth is, I, I think, you know, the fact that we go out and do what we love, we're just going to be economically and sociologically better at doing that thing than the people who are being forced into doing what. Exactly. Doing. Imagine if everyone on the planet did exactly what they were best at and what they were most passionate about how much happier our world would be, how much more efficient and effective our world would be. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, I, of course, there's probably not a lot of people who are passionate about cleaning toilets or, you know, like growing garlic or whatever it may be. Um, so, so I do know that there is a certain level of flawed logic here. It's like, it's just easier for me to say that because I was lucky enough to find that level of success, but not everybody is kind of like that. I mean, for, for every single person who is doing grunt work, there's so many more that's working at Starbucks pursuing their music career on the side or whatever. Uh, and I know that I'm a lucky person to, to yes. not be in that position anymore. Um, but, but yeah, no, like, I, it all, I, yeah, I think it also takes some sort of personal responsibility of reflecting and, and educating yourself because I forget who was telling me this, but they were in Fiji and there, this person's job from the island was just sweeping a path. Uh, it was just a dirt path and they would just sweep the, the trees that had fallen that night, uh, some, some shrub. And so they brush it every morning. This is their job. And the guy was curious. I think it was Tony Robbins' son, actually, Jarek, a, a friend of mine. And he said, you know, how do you do this every day? You look so happy. And it just seems like such a mundane task, a monotonous task and trivial task. And he said, oh, no, no, I'm not sweeping. I'm clearing the path for my guests to guide their way to their next adventure. And I was, he was mind blown, like, wow. He had such a deeper level of meaning 
for what his role really meant to him. So I think it's, it's how you assign that role, the, the internal dialogue you give yourself, the label that you use. And so I think it's so important to recognize what do we tell ourselves on a daily basis? Because you talk to yourself more than anybody else in the world. Mm -hmm. And so how you talk to yourself is going to dictate how you show up in the world, in your workplace, in your role, in your purpose for, for life. So even if it, to us, it might look like a maybe trivial task to them, it might mean something different to them. It might have a greater value and hopefully everyone could find what they're most passionate about and, and what they're most confident in. And my, my favorite book, I rec it's, the book I recommend more often than any other book, it's Flow mm. by Dr. Mihai Chesen Mihai. And it's all about flow state, which is the intersection of your greatest passion and greatest competency. I think it's such a valuable book that everyone should read, especially if you're young and you're growing up. And, you know, speaking of advice to, to the younger generation, I want to get your take on what advice do you give parents that are maybe dealing with a young kid who's playing video games and maybe they're doing it more of a hobby than a career. I mean, what do you tell parents like that that are worried and said, oh, I don't know if my kid's that good. I don't think he could look at this as a career choice. And what do you give, what advice do you give the kid who's dealing with their parents? So, so something I need to clarify on the game industry is, is that there's such a strong misconception of what video games are. Um, to give you some 2019 stats real quick, I actually pulled these out before, uh, before this call started. 65% of all Americans play video games every day. And that is, isn't that crazy? Like a good majority of Americans play games every day. Sure, you're pulling out your phone and playing Angry Birds, but that's still a video game. And there's a purpose for why you're doing that. 79% um, of all gamers say that video games are a very strong positive influence in, on their lives. That's not what you would expect because everyone thinks that games are, you know, played by little boys who destroy their lives, right? Here's another fun stat. There are two times more uh, women above the age of 18 playing games than boys below the age of 18. Wow. Like, yeah, twice as much. Isn't that just nuts? Like video games are not toys for kids. And I think as a society, we need to start recognizing that. And um, we could capitalize on it because then you can use entertainment as edutainment. You can educate people. You can get them to do good things. You can influence their behavior through something that's fun. Yeah, I mean, like, we're, we're talking about, sure, education or games for good or whatever, but even games that aren't for good. League of Legends saved my life. That was not a game for good. Uh, there were research that was done that showed that people who play Tetris within 24 hours of a traumatic event, they're 80% more likely to not develop PTSD. It's Tetris, you know, like nothing to do with games for good. Um, it's just video games are so powerful for our society. I mean, in the pandemic that we're going through right now, Animal Crossing has cropped up to be something that everyone is talking about. Uh, what is Animal Crossing? Well, it's, it's a game where you build your house, decorate it, and you have guests over. It is literally a replacement of society, uh, like how we do on, in the, in the social, social norm. Um, that's why it's so popular. It's because now video games are able to uh, kind of create an escape. Uh, another great example is a Halo 3 many, many years ago, like decades ago, <coughs> a decade ago, Halo 3 hosted this tournament where, uh, I don't know if you play Halo, but there's this, like, this idea where the aliens are invading Earth. And now everyone in the world, like literally everyone in the world has to defend the Earth for 24 hours. Well, what happened is that during that 24 hours, a lot of people played online matches with people around the world to try to defend Earth, work together. And because the game matches IP addresses that are close to each other for low latency for online play, a lot of people, a lot of kids from Israel were matched with kids in Palestine. In Palestine. And these kids started playing with each other and developed all sorts of bonds and just lifelong friendships because they're working together to defend the world. And just like this type of aspect of video games are not things that people talk about. We talk about shooting simulations. Well, Halo is a shooting simulation, but look what it did to, to the people over there. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I guess- Bringing thing, people together. So what, so what if a parent's listening right now, what would you advise them to do to educate them? I mean, stats are one thing, but what do they actually tell their, their kid or how should they be thinking about this? And also from the kid's point of view, how do they deal with their parent? Right, right. So, so the main advice that I have for people is really something that my mom did for me when I was growing up. And that is whenever I play video games, she would be there to play with me. 
Uh, if it's a single player game, I would be playing and then she would be watching, kind of like watching a movie together. And then, you know, afterwards she'd be like, so how do you feel about this? And then we open a conversation regarding, well, I, I felt like this guy was kind of a dick to me. And then like we would talk about kind of how I feel and then, and then she would guide me onto the right path. I mean, why is it that we watch Captain America together with our kids um, where, you know, he's going around slaughtering people really, and that's okay. But then, you know, we're, we're playing video games and suddenly the game is just a, you know, shooting simulation where it's also a babysitter at the same time. Touche, um, touche. Yeah, so, so for, for kids as well, I think the number one advice I have for you is to just go out there and experiment with games and go find as many games as possible to play. Um, games are fantastic in the sense that it is a very, very safe space for you to fail. You know, in school, when you fail, you get a bad grade, you get a bad GPA, you can't go to grad school, you can't find a job. Uh, you know, in, in the jobs environment, if you fail, you get fired, you lose your income, you lose your mortgage, you lose your family. Um, in the video game, if you fail, you start over and you lose 10 minutes oh, of progress. And, and yeah, like in that world, don't be afraid to fail. And by playing a lot of games with other people, with your parents, with your friends, you're able to develop the resilience to know that you can always keep going forward. I love that. Invite your family to play with you. Mm -hmm. uh, enjoy it together, just like you would a movie. Um, so thinking about when you turn this from an art in into something that's now generating over 1 million in revenue, you know, how did you make that transition? When you quit, you ultimately like, went into this full time, you started creating more and more games. Uh, who was paying you? Who's your customer? Who's your ideal client? And, and what's something scrappy you did to hustle to get to where you are now that maybe you couldn't have revealed in the beginning, but you can now that you've made it to where you are? Honestly, that's, that's kind of a tough question because I feel like I'm still hustling. <laughs> I feel like probably all people feel the same way uh, in their lives, no matter how old they are. Um, and and I, I think in the early days, uh, you know, we were doing very little of our own IPs. We're mostly working with clients, um, people who come to us with projects and, and then we would do it. Um, I remember one of the first projects that we received was right after I graduated college, uh, like a few months afterwards. Um, the, uh, it was an educational game um, because of our educational games in the past. They wanted to kind of create their own educational game. I wanted to hire us to make it happen. Um, and we were still working in a basement. So we would, you know, s secretly rent out rooms or like go to coffee shops and make it sound like we have this like actual company going around. We would, you know, set, put together like the best looking website to make it seem like we're professional. Take, we literally took pictures of like office spaces that we weren't a part of and just like make it look like that's our office. Uh, and then eventually like, I, I think uh, they eventually wanted to, like the CEO wanted to fly out to actually visit us and we're like, oh shit, like it was gonna, uh, so we had to uh, like, put together an office like last minute find the the most no affordable way. thing I put together the furniture two days before the ceo arrived and then we like would host a guest um and it's just you know like just putting together stuff like that i think it was super scrappy i mean the irony of the situation is that a year later that company went bankrupt and we're still around so it goes to show that i guess you know a lot of times uh, in the in a, in a company's history um, they're sometimes maybe pretending and making a scrappy is actually the better way to do things because otherwise you're, you know, blowing your money on beautiful offices. And then before you know it, you're out of cash. Um, yes, yeah, I mean, focus like, on revenue generating activities, bringing exactly. the customers in the door and, and you were doing it and you, you made it happen. I mean, that is a creative way. I love it. And now <laughs> you guys are based out of Colorado. Yeah, we're in Boulder, uh, east side of Boulder. I mean, we still have a pretty scrappy office, something like five, 6,000 square foot. Um, and uh, we're, we're literally on top of a, a pot, like a marijuana grow house, uh, and it's just because the rent is a little lower over there. It's so Colorado-esque. Yeah, right. Um, but at the same time, you know, like we try to make our uh, environment as, as peaceful as possible. We bought all these like warm lights everywhere. So we don't have any fluorescents in the office. We kind of just turn those off. Um, we uh, have fully carpeted floors that are washed. So we don't even wear shoes in the office, like because we were originally in this basement, you know, one of our basements that was fully carpeted, and so we weren't allowed to wear shoes there. And then once we transitioned, we're just like, hey, this is actually kind of comfy. Like that's what I do at home. Might as well not wear shoes at work either. Uh, so we still keep that. It's just like I don't know. It's a lot of the things that we love do that. are very focused on the people that work there. I love that. So what if someone's listening right now? and they want to work for your team, where would they go? And what if someone right now is listening like, hey, I want a game built for us. Um, you know, 
who's your biggest customer and where would they go if they want to be your customer? Yeah, yeah. So serenityforge.com is definitely the, the best place to go to find all the information. Um, in terms of customers, uh, we are always looking for partners to work with on anything that's you know meaningful, values-driven type of video game or interactive experiences. Uh, you know, stuff that we've done in the past. Uh, you know, a couple years ago, we finished a project with the St. Jude Children's Hospital, where we created games for terminally ill children between the ages of five to ten. Uh, games that are installed in the hallways where kids in wheelchairs can kind of pull up and and put their arms out and fly around as an eagle to feel a sense of freedom while they going through chemotherapy you know like games like that are our are, are wheelhouse that's our specialty we want to create games for good and kind of games that are able to help the world so anyone that are uh, anyone that's interested in kind of finding a team that's able to do that that's definitely us uh, in terms of people who want to work with us we're always hiring nowadays uh, we just hired a bunch of people earlier this year and now we're trying to look for more uh, kind of staff of our programming team um, so, so yeah, I mean, like there's, uh, our, our email is jobs at serenityforge.com. It's probably the easiest one for us to collect the resumes. Perfect. Yeah. Unfortunately, the game industry is huge and there's all, we get like hundreds of applicants every week. Uh, so generally like we don't really have, like, we can't promise to respond to every person, but we do see every single applicant. Perfect. And we'll put this in the show notes for you listening. And, uh, we're going to transition now into something I like to call the under 30 seconds round. I'm going to fire off some questions. I want you to answer with the first thing that comes to mind. You ready? All right. Sounds good. Number one, what's the book you've gifted more often than any other book and why? The Happiness Advantage by Sean Acor. Uh, happiness is a choice. Uh, it's not a result of what you do. And that book absolutely changed my life. Highly recommend it. I literally just brought him up yesterday. He, a Harvard professor, he has the most enrolled in Harvard class in all of Harvard history about oh, happiness. And I found out about him from Tim Ferriss's episode actually back, I think in 2013, where he identified the five things you can do, uh, the bare minimum you could do with the greatest return on investment to statistically significantly increase your happiness, which uh, will be shared in the episode. You'll have to tune in for that to find out what were those five. Uh, number two, Z, thanks. That's a great recommendation. What's one of the best investments and one of the worst investments you've ever made and why? So best investment would definitely be the people that I work with. Um, there's uh, specific people that I work with today that are just so pivotal to where we are right now uh, as, as a Serenity Forge. I mean, I can go into details, but 30 seconds, that's kind of the best I can do. Worst investments, honestly, you know, from a personal standpoint, embarrassed to say it, I was one of those people who drank the Kool-Aid about Bitcoins during its hype. Uh, you know, I bought high and, uh, and still are holding <laughs> as of today. So I guess everyone makes financial mistakes no matter who you are. What's the most impactful thing you do in your morning routine and the most impactful thing you do in your evening routine? So I am a tea nut. Uh, I drink so much tea and I practice all sorts of the way of tea and tea ceremonies. Uh, for example, I'm currently drinking tea out of this uh, little uh, uh, segmented clay teapot right now. Uh, so in the morning, that's what I do. I host a little mini Chinese tea ceremony for myself to clear my mind and get, get, get the day going. Um, and then at night, honestly, this is, this is going to be super counterintuitive, but I, uh, but I love staring at screens before bedtime. Like I would literally pull up some kind of mobile game and just play it in bed and then I would fall asleep to it. Um, I've never had problems with falling asleep because I have onset insomnia, which is in the morning, I wake up way, way too early. Uh, so at night, usually I just kind of sleep fine. I'd maybe not recommend that to everyone listening. There you go. Pretend you won the Peter Thiel Fellowship and you were going to get money to start a business rather than go to college. What's the very first thing you do to start a new business? Find the people to work with. Um, I, I think it's very, it's very, uh, it's a very romantic idea for one person to be like, I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm going to be a founder and go do something crazy. Um, but nothing in the world, in, in today's world at least, can be done by yourself. Anything, nothing like impactful at least. Um, I think I was very lucky to find such amazing people, just amazing team to work with at a very early on stage uh, that uh, you know we wouldn't be here today without the people I work with every day. Um, our marketing director, Kevin, uh, we literally are, we were friends. We met during driver's ed in high school uh, and, and we've been making games together since then. And, you know, Amazing. I've been making games longer with him than I have known, like then I have not known him, I guess. Uh, so the fact that you are building these lifelong relationships, uh, that's how you really find success in today's corporate world. Last one. What's something you never knew you needed? 
Something I never knew I needed. Oh, I don't know. That's a, that's a tough one. I'll give you an example. For me, okay. it is a rebounder. A rebounder is a mini trampoline that instead of metal springs, they use bungee cords. So you get two times the force of gravity on your body weight. It lymphasizes the body. So your lymphatic system is flushing out the toxins. And I use it anytime I'm lacking energy throughout the day or I need to change my mood. I blast some music and jump on the, the rebounder, the trampoline, and it immediately changes my energy. I've had them. I had three in my last place uh, in 20, since 2013. I've had them and they're amazing. A game changer. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, it's uh, the you know honestly the best thing I can think of is uh, about a year ago I made a random purchase due to some random dude that sat to uh, I, I like sat on the plane with me because he was wearing this pair of headphones that just looked so quirky and weird. Um, it's the AfterShocks AirTrex. So they are the uh, the bone conduction headphones. So basically, they're not on your head. They're like they're next to your ears, and they conduct audio based on uh, based on your bone, like shaking your the bones in your ears. Um, and I thought it was really quirky, so I decided to get one, and it was an absolute game changer for me because I travel a lot. I used to, or at least you know before this, I used to you know fly a lot. And one of the uh, things that I love doing is, well, I love listening to audio, and I love putting in he- earphones because I'm really sensitive to audio. I don't like to you know hear the loud noises. Now I can do both. Uh, literally, I you know you put in he- uh, the, these um, you know earplugs, and then you you t- t- tone out all of the sounds around you. But then you put on these headphones, and it's just most clear audio you can possibly get. You get great audio, uh, audio book sounds. You get great music sounds. Um, and it's just been a huge life changer for me. You're, you're my first gamer on the podcast. So the first <laughs> guest that, I've, that has also had the big headphones with the mic and everything. So uh, Z, thank you so much for being here today. Before you go, what's the next big goal, milestone, or bucket list item you want to achieve? Yeah, so, so I know um, this is going to sound really kooky depending on who you are, but it's not necessarily for me, but more for the video game industry. It's something that I personally have always had a belief in. And that is, I would love to see before I die someone who is a game designer that wins a Nobel Peace Prize uh, for what they did. Uh, video games, you know, uh, after this episode, uh, you know, you're well aware, uh, you know, video games can do so much for society and for people. Um, you know, there's no reason why there can't be a game designer that could make a, uh, you know, a, a, a world changing experience that really put people together. So, so I guess, you know, that's probably my best answer. I want to see someone do that. Not, it's not necessarily me. It's not necessarily someone I know or Serenity Forge. It's just one game designer that's able to make that. I love it. I love it. Great idea. And it will happen. And it might be you. Um, where do listeners go to connect with you directly? Yeah, I'm probably easiest uh, reached on Twitter. So my Twitter is just my full name. So at Jinghua Yang, Z-H-E-N-G-H-U-A-Y-A-N-G. Um, and then at Serenity Forge is our company. Um, and then besides that, I'm pretty easily reachable via our Discord channel. I don't know if anyone uses Discord. It's mostly gamers who do that. Um, but just discord.gg slash Serenity Forge, you can find us. Uh, and then lastly, of course, our website as well, just serenityforge.com. And we'll put all of those in the show notes. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here today. This is Z with Serenity Forge, who makes gaming for good. We learned so much today what to do if you're a parent with a gaming child, how to turn your greatest pain into your greatest gift, how lucky we truly are. We learned so much, so many nuggets here today. Z, thank you so much for being here today. It was such a pleasure. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. And, uh, you know, hopefully something I said is uh, able to resonate with the, with the viewers. And ladies and gentlemen, go check out his new game, Never Song, which is on Apple Arcade, Steam, and all your consoles. Hope this episode helped you as much as it helped me. Have an amazing day. Thanks for joining us today. I hope this episode helped you as much as it helped me. Who do you think would benefit from hearing it? You can make an impact on their life by sharing it now. Before you go, I encourage you to tell us your favorite part of the episode in the review section. Now it's time to level up. Level up.